Okay, so uh, like Chris said, my name is Jeff Carruth. I am uh, from College Station, Texas, about three and a half hours south of here. I don't know if you know where that is, home of the Aggies. Okay, uh, so I am co organizer of the BCS PHP user group, and I speak and do all kinds of other stuff, so that's really not that interesting. What we're going to talk about today is story BDD. So, how many of you are familiar with TDD, test driven development? Okay, how many of you practice TDD? Maybe a couple, okay. How about BDD? Have you heard of BDD? Do you practice or use BDD? And who suffers from ADD? <laughs> Daniel? Cool. What? Yeah. Uh, so, so BDD is actually two different types. And they deal with uh, spec-based BDD, which is for your code. So this is more of the unit level test. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about story BDD. So this is dealing with the whole application. This is dealing with your application through its interface. Now to understand why you might be interested in story BDD, I've got a story, a story about a previous experience of mine. Uh, at a previous employer, a few years ago, I had a, I worked in a smaller department that was within a much larger company, and there was a, another department that was, you know, higher up in the food chain, you know, maybe they signed our paychecks, I don't know, something like that. And they contracted us, and by contracted I mean commandeered me, and most of my time for a little while, to build an application for them. And I spent a lot of time and blood, sweat, and tears in it, getting it done as quickly as they wanted, and they were rather demanding, and upper management basically said, do what they want. They signed our paychecks, do what they want. So one evening, I was on my way home, and I get an email that says, hi Jeff, we have this really awesome feature, we need this feature, and we need it tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. I'm like, whoa, okay. So I call my boss and I say, hey, uh, should I just tell them no? Because this is kind of ridiculous. Like, I've got things to do. And he said, well, upper management says we should do what they want, so do you think you could do it? I said, well, probably, but, you know, they're getting on a plane and I, have no, I can't talk to them about this, so I don't know exactly what they want. He said, well, just do it. So being the naive developer that I was, I decided I would give it a shot. And I ended up staying up pretty late working on this feature, and I finished it. I was like, okay, cool. Next morning, deployed it, called them up, said, erect monuments in my honor, I've, I've uh, completed your feature that you requested yesterday at six, or whatever time it was, and so there you go. And they said, oh, we had a chance to check it out, and it's not exactly what we wanted. So how many times have you been in a situation where you're told you need to deliver a feature, but you're already late, right? Like you're told today, and it was actually needed three weeks ago. It happens a lot in software development, and you can trace it to a few problems. In my case, or in that specific example, the first problem was upper management did not support me as a developer. Unfortunately, Story BDD can't fix that yet. When Skynet goes live, we're all about it, right? Uh, but so we can't fix that particular problem. But we do have a couple other problems that BDD or Story BDD can help with. The first one is miscommunication. There's a language barrier between developers, engineers, and product owners, and, and sometimes even internally, your managers or you know, your other teammates, there may be language barriers. And we're not talking about product owners speaking Mandarin and you're speaking Swahili, right? We're talking about misunderstandings and a lot of the background that you bring to the table. So an example of that might be, a customer comes to you and says, hey, I need to track my customers in this application. You say, okay, and your developer brain starts spinning, and you say, all right, we need a user table, we need, uh, we need logins, we need forgot password links, we need all this, all this jazz. You start thinking technically, how do you track users in an application? What they really want is a way to log phone calls. That's what they mean by tracking customers. So how do you deal with that communication gap? Story BDD can help, we'll see how. The second issue is defining done. So how do you know when what you've been working on actually satisfies the feature request? Someone tells you they need something and you say, all right, and you start hacking on it, and you end up with 300 lines of code, and you say, okay, it's done. Well, you might have made too little functionality, or you might have made too much functionality, or maybe you got it just right. Maybe you're Goldilocks, so you pick just the right amount of functionality. That doesn't usually happen. So we need a way to define done. We need a way to work with product owners and define finished or completed. And that's what Story BDD brings to the table. So I've talked a little bit about Story BDD, and, and we're going to steal a concept from agile development. 
which I'm not an agile coach, I don't play one on TV, so I may get a little terminology wrong, but we're just talking about one small aspect. That's user stories. You familiar with user stories? Do you use user stories? A little bit sometimes, maybe, not really? Okay, that's cool, me either. Uh, but user stories, the idea of a user story is to put yourself, or to, to frame a request in the context of what a user is expecting. So a user, in a lot of cases, could be a customer at your e-commerce store, or could be a user of your CRM system, or whatever. They're, they're someone that needs some functionality. So a user story is a sentence, or a, a group of sentences sometimes, that's going to describe from their perspective what functionality they need and why. So you're focusing on who, what, and why. And we'll see that in a second. But a simple user story could be a sentence. It could just say, suppose we're making a system that conference organizers can use to open a call for papers, and then speakers can submit uh, to, the, to this call for papers and say, here's the talk I want to give at your conference. So we're making the system and we look at a user story for a potential speaker. A potential speaker should be able to submit proposals to a CFP. That's, a fair, that's the basic user story. Now, to help you, to help you write more effective and compelling user stories, uh, people have come up with templates, and there's probably 10, 10 or so different templates that I've seen floating around that say, this is the best one to get you thinking in, users, in user stories. Uh, but you know, there's not a right answer. But if we look at the basic template, or this is the most common that I've seen, is as a who, I want what, so that why. So this is forcing you to focus on those three important words, who, what, and why, as opposed to how. Now what is not a user story? A user story shouldn't contain things like, I need a button, I need a button on a page, I need a form, like that's not, that's not a user story. Like a user doesn't say, you know what I wish this website had? I wish it had 10 buttons on it. They don't ever say that. Customers might, they want big buttons, right? Customers might say it, but users don't. So you need to speak from the user's voice and say what they need to accomplish in your application. Uh, so a user story is a way to replace a requirement specification, that huge document that you get at the very beginning of a project that says, here's everything you need to implement down to the pixel, and it needs to be exactly like this in every browser you've ever seen, and so on and so forth. That's just not realistic. User stories help you get away from that mindset and into a mindset of providing value, providing business value. So if we apply this user story into the template, it would look like, as a potential speaker, I want to submit proposals so that my talks can be considered for a conference. Okay, that's, that's pretty basic, right? That's, does that make sense? That's easy enough? So you're thinking about who, what, and why. Well, maybe you really want to focus on the why in your case. Like maybe it's hard for you to focus on that last bit, so you want to put it prominent. So you come up with your own template, or you borrow somebody else's that puts it in a different order. It says, for some benefit, as a type of user, I need a functionality. And remember not to phrase the functionality in terms of the technical side of things. Don't let a bunch of technical mumbo jumbo get into your user stories, because it's not, it's not necessary and it's not relevant at that point in time when you're dealing with a user story. So how do you take and how do you use a user story? kind of meta, right, using user story. Uh, but if you wanted to take a user story and use it for something good in your application, you have to distill it. And what I mean by that is you're going to take a user story and turn it into acceptance criteria. Now, acceptance criteria, you can think of it as a checklist of items that say, once all of these check true, or once I can say all of these items are done, this story is satisfied. So I've completed this feature. This is your definition of done. The acceptance criteria become <coughs> your completion. They say, okay, product owner, you asked me for this. I worked with you for a long time developing these acceptance criteria, and now I've done them. So, feature's done. This could be something that you print out in the document, give to your uh, manual QA team, if that's, if that's what you're into. And they could go through and check off hundreds and hundreds of acceptance criteria every time you release something. But we're gonna look at how we can turn it into something more automated because automated is better if you're a developer, right? So acceptance criteria from our example user story. Uh, the first one might be, the speaker has access to a proposal submission form. Now this could be from the conversation with your product owner, you determine that you're gonna only open the call for a certain amount of time, which makes sense, or maybe you have to have a user account. So people could be denied access. So part of your acceptance criteria is, 
a user can access the submission form. A second set of criteria you may get out of the product owner may be, okay, last year we had this call for papers that we opened, and some people submitted, but they didn't fill out their email address. So we had no way to tell them that they got accepted or rejected. So we want to make sure that all the required fields are filled out. This may seem rather basic, but in this case it's a business value as opposed to a technical requirement of required fields must be required. The uh, third criteria that you may pull out of this particular user story is that a speaker should see a confirmation message once they've uh, submitted their proposal. This could be anything. This could be a simple message. This could be a particular box you're looking for. Uh, you could also go into emails if you really wanted to be dangerous and deal with testing with emails. Um, for slide examples, we're not dealing with emails. So we're just dealing with a message that pops up on the screen here. Uh, so the, the wording, you can see, is a little ambiguous, right? It doesn't, it doesn't specify too much what you're looking for, but it tells you just enough that you can, you can test for each one of these. You could write something in code that could verify each one of these steps. That's the idea. You're distilling a user story into a set of testable segments that you can go through and verify. So now we've got, we've got our story and we've got some criteria. Now we need something, some way that we can actually test these criteria. And that's where scenarios come in. So scenarios is a term that deals with uh, BDD tests, uh, story BDD tests specifically. Uh, but it's, it's a way to take an acceptance criteria and turn it into context, action, and results, or expectations. So what you do is you use a language called the Gherkin language, or the Gherkin syntax, which this is a domain-specific language designed for these tests originally. Uh, there's a Ruby project called Cucumber, which uses Gherkin syntax. There's several others. There's one for Java, I forget what it's called. But they all use the Gherkin syntax because it's powerful enough to allow you to define context, to perform actions, and then to verify your acceptance criteria. So the keywords are obviously given, when, and then. But just keep in mind that you're, you're testing an action and a result. So where does your result go? Or what does your result represent? This is going to be worded very similarly to your acceptance criteria. You will generally have one, maybe a few, scenarios per acceptance criteria. If you have a significantly larger number of criteria, like if you have 10 to 15 criteria per story, or you have five or six scenarios just to test to see what criteria, you haven't done enough work, right? You haven't distilled enough. So go back and change your story. Go back and change your acceptance criteria to be a little more specific so you can test it easier. So if you've done all your homework and you've got your acceptance criteria, you've got your user story, and you distilled it down into these simple steps, which is what we're going to do to create an actual automated uh, test. Let's do it with our example. So say we want to check, this is checking the uh, required fields that all have to be filled in. So say we want to check that. So our acceptance criteria is I need to see, or I need all the fields to be required. So we test that by saying I should see please fill in all required fields. Similarly worded, makes sense, matches up with our acceptance criteria. The specific actions we're going to perform is we're going to be on the home page, we're going to click a link, we're going to fill in only one field out of the form. Uh, we could just submit a blank form if we really wanted to, but just for fun we filled in a, the email address. And then we click submit and we should see the message. This is our test. This is what our test is going to look like. We're going to combine it a little bit and then run it, but this is the bulk of what scenarios look like in BHAT and other uh, BDD languages. So coupling them together. It's really just a matter of taking your user story, putting it at the top of a page, and then putting your scenarios underneath it. This is called a feature file, but it's written in Gherkin, so indentation is important, and line endings are important. It's kind of like Python or YAML in that regard. Every line in a scenario represents a step, or a single, uh, single action, or a single idea. Uh, so every line is significant, and then the indentation tells Gherkin where to pick up a scenario as opposed to a feature. So we wanted to look at that. Let's pretend we're working on the Unix LS utility. And we want to test and make sure that when you use LS, you can see uh, the, the files or the contents in a directory. This is the canonical example that Behat uses to show you what it looks like. So this is an entire feature file. You could call it ls.feature if you wanted to. Uh, but we say our user story 
is in order to see the directory structure as a Unix user, I need to be able to list the current directory's contents. So then we have our acceptance criteria, which is when I run ls, I should see the contents of the directory. So that's our acceptance criteria right here. And then we're just going to say our background is going to be, given I'm in a directory, I've got two files. When I run ls, I should see that output. This is a feature file, and this is what you're going to run as an automated <coughs> test using behat. If we wanted to look at our example in web, in web, in web language, we could say, OK, we've got our user story at the top up here, and then we've got our three scenarios. This represents each of our acceptance criteria. And you see we've got them. I should see please fill in the form. I should see please fill in all required fields. And I should see thank you for submitting. So this satisfies the acceptance criteria for <coughs> the, the uh, product owner that we talked to. So language isn't terribly important, but we've got things like that tell you I'm, I'm on a home page. I follow these links. I fill in these fields. This is what a feature file will look like. And we're going to see how to use them in just a, in just a little bit. So, okay, so we've got, we've taken user stories, we've turned them into acceptance criteria, we've taken acceptance criteria and turned them into scenarios. We've taken the scenarios and combined them into a feature file using the proper Gherkin syntax. We're ready to run tests now. How do we do it? Well, if you read the subtitle, you know that we might use a tool called Behat. We're also going to throw in another tool called Me. Now, uh, typically, if you're, do, if you're dealing with web applications, which your PHP developers or you're maybe interested in PHP, so I assume that you're working with the web most of the time anyway. Uh, but if you're dealing with that, typically you're not going to use Behat by itself. You're going to be using Meek as well because of the, because of the uh, additional features that it provides with Behat. So what are they? Well, Behat itself is simply a test runner. It's a tool that, uh, that uses Gherkin and can understand uh, scenarios and, and run them. That's, all, that's basically all Behat does. It is, a, it is a library that has a binary that just runs just like PHP units uh, binary or any other test runner. Uh, so the idea is it's testing with business logic. So this is the user stories aspect. That's what Behat deals with. Mink is a web acceptance testing library or sometimes they call it web acceptance testing framework. And the idea, what Meek actually does, Meek itself, what it does is it drives web browsers or headless, headless browsers. Um, it can drive Selenium and Sahi, which are similar, if you're familiar with Selenium. But it has an API that ex is exposed in PHP that can drive a web browser to interact with and view pages on a web server. If you couple them together, and you do that with an extension, you can now use your Behat test to drive web drivers. That's where the power of Behat plus me comes in. So how do you get them? How do you get going? You can, you can download FARs, PHP archives. Uh, I've actually never done that because I don't, I like to tinker with things. So if you've got a FAR, it's not that easy to debug and look in the code that you're going through. So uh, I tend to get things from the source, which used to be through Pear, or you could download through GitHub. But now there's a new tool called Composer. Is everyone familiar with Composer? Is anybody familiar with it? OK. All right. At its basic level, Composer is a dependency manager. It's a package, package manager for PHP projects. Uh, if you're familiar with Node, uh, NPM is, is the example there. If you're familiar with uh, Ruby, Bundler is the example. Um, but basically, it allows you to specify in a text file or in a JSON file the dependencies that your application has, and then it's going to download them and install them for you and deal with versioning between them. So if you've got if you've got a dependency on three libraries and each of them has dependencies on other libraries, Composer will help you resolve all the version numbers. Sometimes it will spit all over your screen and tell you you've screwed something up, but it's it's a decent tool. It's really cool if you're if you've got projects that have other libraries you're using like uh, Symphony or Z Framework 2 or whatever, you can use Composer to get it. Uh, if you're interested in that, getcomposer.org is where you go to uh, download and learn all about it. So this is what a composer.json file looks like. Uh, this could be for this example project. And you'll see that I've given it a name, jcruise cfp. That's not really required. Then we've got, some, we've got a require block, which this is going to represent all of the requirements for my application to run. We've got a require dev block, which is going to represent all of the uh, dependencies for anyone developing the application. So this is where we're going to specify we had and 
uh, me. So that's what we're going to focus on. You'll notice we're including the hat, we're including me, and we're including the Meek extension. The Meek extension is for the hat itself, and that's what tells the hat, or that's what enables the hat to communicate with the Meek web driver, web driving API. Uh, then we've got the Gout driver, or Goot driver, excuse me, French, uh, different languages, right? Uh, but we've got the Goot driver, and then we've got the Selenium 2 driver. There is a zombie driver, and I think somebody has a non-official uh, Phantom JS driver, but that's more your thing. I had a lot of trouble with Zombie.js, as did many other people, so uh, Selenium 2 is what we use uh, at Liptopia. Um, if, if you want to try it, go for a Zombie. It may work, it may not, just be aware of it. It's kind of shady. Uh, we also include PHP unit, and the reason we do that is we have unit tests, and then the other reason is the hat does not include assertions. It does not include any kind of assertions. So if you want to do that in your tests, you have to, ex you have to include an external assertion library which I prefer PHP in. So if we, if we write this file out, or if we have this file in our project called composer.json, and then we go get composer, we can then install all the dependencies. And you'll see that it goes through and installs all of the application dependencies, and then it's gonna install all the dev dependencies, write a lock file, and then give us an auto load, give us, give us auto loading. Uh, so the idea here is we've downloaded everything that we need to get the hat running. So we're now ready to start running those features that we, we wrote. Normally we do this the other way around, but uh, so if we if we got a brand new project and we haven't written anything, we can initialize it using the behat binary using init dash dash init, and this is going to create two directories and one file. The two directories are going to be the place where you store your features, and then what's known as bootstrapping, which is what contains all of the files that re will represent your uh, step definitions or those individual items within your scenarios, uh, and it actually generates a feature context for you, so you're ready to go right out of the bat if you use the internet. So we've talked about steps and step definitions within scenarios. Now we need to learn how does Behat understand them? How does Behat use that natural language as code, or how does it execute code according to that natural language? Uh, it uses re regular expressions, uh, and I know some people run away as soon as they hear that. Uh, it's actually not it's not that bad with Behat, it helps you out, and we're going to see that in a little bit when we write a custom, uh, custom step definition. But if we wanted to look at our scenario, we say, okay, this is the scenario we're going to test for, the required scenario. So we've got three steps. We've got this given, I'm on a page slash submit. We've got a, an action, we're going to press the submit button. And then we've got a confirmation, our acceptance criteria. I should see a message that says, we need to fill the required fields. So we need to translate, and we're going to start with the I am on submit. We're going to translate that from English or semi-English into code. We might say, okay, we had, could probably provide that. That seems like something that's really, really common. Like probably a lot of people are going to write tests that want to deal with going to a specific URL. So we go look with Behat and we say, okay, do you provide it already? The DL, uh, the Behat DL is a way to list out the definitions that Behat has access to, or the step definitions that Behat can access, and it just shows you the, basically the regular expression that it uses. So this is pretty handy when you're wanting to see what is available that you can use in your scenarios. Dash DL will print them out for you. So if we run this, which I actually did run, prior to pasting it on here, we'll see that Behat, as configured with the in init method, has exactly zero step definitions. So it provides no help to us whatsoever in getting our web test going. That's, you know, that, that's okay. We can write them ourselves, right? No big deal. So we're gonna go through, we're gonna say, all right, here's what our feature context looks like. So we've got a bunch of boilerplate, there's a huge comment, it's probably like 20 lines that says, here's where you add your custom step definitions. So we wanna go through and we're gonna add a custom definition for the visit, for our I am on whatever page, okay. Easy enough, right? We've got a regular expression. We know how to write those. So I say, given I am on this page, this is our regular expression, and I want to execute this. This function is going to be executed by the hat when this regular expression matches a step. Now, the thing to remember, or the thing to, to realize here is, this is such a common, uh, a common step that probably we don't want to write it ourselves, right? Like this, 
This is a bunch of stuff that I actually copied this from me because it's already implemented in me. So we're gonna see that in just a second. But the idea here is we just use a regular expression to match any, and we can have this as a given, we can have this as a when. Actually, I think it is in me both a given and a when. So this defines a matcher for behat to look for. I've got this string in my scenario. Does it match any of these annotations? Okay. So using me, right? We downloaded me, we included it in our uh, composer file, so let's use it. Let's look at what it provides. To do that, we just need to add the uh, namespace for the meet context, and then we need to extend the meet context. Our feature context needs to extend meet context. Doing that, just those two lines of code, if we run behat dl, we now get access to all of these step definitions. And I know it's really small, you don't need to worry about reading it, but these, these are, this is everything that's provided by the meek extension by default. So we've got things like I'm on the home page, uh, I go to this page, I should, not, I should see text matching this, I should not see text matching this. It does a lot of things for you out of the box. So in our specific case, I wrote these in this language because I knew that meek already had these steps defined. So we, we're at, you know, I am on the submit page, I fill an email, I fill in a, a form field with a value, and then I press a button, and then I see some text. So if we look in that DL, in that uh, output, we'll see these definitions. We'll see, given I'm on this page, and the I is optional, but, and then fill in and press and submit, or and see. So these are all provided by Meek. Just by extending the Meek context, we get access to use all of these. And that's great. That gets us most of the way there for most of our uh, web tests that we're going to be writing. But occasionally we're going to come up with, well, not occasionally, often, we'll come up with situations where we need something custom, right? We, we have some specific user access system that we need to set up in our context, or in our background context. So we need a way to write our own step definitions. Custom steps are actually really easy to, to add into your uh, scenario files, uh, you just type out English, right? And then we're gonna run, we're actually gonna run the test. So it seems counterintuitive to write a step in a scenario, and then run the test and hope that it hope that it works. But what actually happens is Behat's gonna help us figure out how to write this. It's gonna write our regular expression for us. So if we add into our uh, submission, to check to see that we have access, if we add in there, then we want to check the username and password, so we need we need to have access to the system before we can access the form. We'll write a custom step that we're gonna add in there that just says given, I have a username and a password that look like this. Uh, it's kind of broken English because the slide is only so long, but normally you'd write that a little better so it reads easier for uh, your product owners who are gonna be reading these tests as well. Uh, but if we run this, <coughs> we're gonna see that all three of our scenarios ran, which you'll see by this three scenarios result, and you'll see that one is undefined, and then we have 12 total steps with one being undefined. The undefined step would be the one we just wrote, the I have username and password. But behat does something nice for us, and in this bottom snip, we actually have the step definition given to us. So behat looks at it and says, here's the regular expression that will match for that specific step that you added, and we can copy and paste this into our feature content which we do like so. We change the arguments from arg1 and arg2 because it's kind of ugly to username and password. You could also name these regular expressions if you really wanted to, to be a little more thorough. But what we do is we just copy that and paste it and then implement whatever needs to be implemented to make that, that context or that step pass. Doing that, then running the test, we'll now have a functioning test up until we realize that we haven't implemented any of that our actual functionality, right? We don't have a form or anything, that's why everything else fails. Uh, but that's, that is the gist of taking a user story, turning it into acceptance criteria, acceptance criteria into scenarios, scenarios into step definitions, and running them with behat and meek. If we look at what we've learned, and how we can do it, we've learned that user stories help us think of our application in terms of the value it provides instead of the specific nuts and bolts that make it up. This is very important in story BDD because you, you want to get out of the idea of, of dealing with perspectives that are yours and deal with perspectives that are people that actually need it. And this is probably the biggest challenge 
that I've ever had dealing with, for example, the owner of a company, because they, they want their application to be, to have their own stamp on it. Like they, they really think, you know, my application should have my stamp on it, so I'm the customer, you need to do what I say. In reality, they need to step back and say, who is my customer? And how does the application work for them? So your job as developers or someone working with a product owner is to push the stories in a direction that's going to give the users value, the, the end users, not the client. It's tough to do. Some people do it well, some people don't. So that's user stories. Then we learned that acceptance criteria help us define done, help us avoid feature creep, which happens a lot, scope creep, feature creep where you've got a feature you're working on and then, oh, maybe we can add just a little bit more. Well, if you've gone through the trouble or the, the process of defining acceptance criteria, you say it's not on this list. It's not, this is not implementing this story. Write another story for it, work on it in the next iteration. That's what this, this enables you to do. So this avoids that situation where you're up to 4 a.m. working for that client that emailed you yesterday at 6 p.m. <coughs> Then we learned that scenarios are the translation of acceptance criteria into runnable tests that will evaluate our acceptance criteria. We learned that uh, the hat runs the scenarios for us using Gherkin DSL, and it's very simple to learn Gherkin and deal with the hat itself uh, running them. So the hat is very friendly in terms of helping us define our custom steps. And then we learned that the Mink extension provides everything or most of the stuff that we need to work through the web with our application. And I already covered this, but custom step definitions aren't scary. They're actually really easy to deal with. Uh, I've probably written uh, in, in my app, in the application I'm working on right now with my company, we started out with exactly zero tests in January of this year, and we now have about 75 to 80 uh, BHAT tests, tests written in BHAT that deal with everything that's important to our CEO and COO. So we, we spent a good deal of time working with them to develop stories from the other direction. So we developed them after the product already exists, but we developed a story so that we could define critical functionality, which then has allowed us to do a lot of refactoring internally with the safety net provided by these tests at the very high level. So we're not breaking any functionality. We've got something that tells us the product still works. So the next steps, Integrate Story BDD into your workflow. You don't have to do it wholesale. You don't have to sit here and say, okay, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna work with my product owners and I'm gonna write all these stories. You can do it internally at first. You can start working with your team to develop stories for the functionality you're working on. This helps all of you bounce ideas off each other and determine how to provide the business value that you're being asked for. Uh, the resources are Git Composer, Behat, and then there's a common context repository on GitHub and the Behat GitHub. Uh, which actually contains about five or six different, uh, you can think of them as context extensions. So this provides some common functionality. If you're using Symphony 2, there's one that deals with the mailing system and there's one that deals with security. Then there's some things for, if you wanna test uh, APIs using Behat, which is actually a common use case for Behat if you're not dealing with an application, you're dealing with an API. It's got an API extension which deals with uh, response codes and sending JSON and so on and so forth. So they're already written and tested, so go check them out before you write, you're writing your own custom uh, step definitions. And that's all I have, so questions? Yes, Jim. <coughs> Will you uh, train like a, I don't know about train, but like get your uh, project managers or product owners to write these tests, or would you just take in the, their input and then have a developer write the test? That's, that's a good question. Um, in, in my opinion, and this works for us because we actually, I do this at Liptopia, uh, when a new feature comes in or a request for a feature comes in, I sit down with our product team and we discuss the user story side of things. So we, we de develop from someone saying, I needed to do X. We sit there and say, okay, what does X apply? Where does it apply and who does it apply to? And we develop several user stories based on each one of those features. And then with that, that product team, I develop acceptance criteria. So what will satisfy them that customer X that requested a feature is satisfied? Where, where do we draw the line? And so they develop that side of things. Actually turning it into a behalf test, the developers do that because typically it's, if you don't, if, if 
if I let them write the actual scenarios, mm -hmm. we would end up with probably 50 extra custom definitions that would fit into something else. Product owners generally aren't good at making things generic, so we write all of the scenarios so that we can kind of hold a hand to getting them done. Good question. Anybody else? Jake again. Do you, uh, so you talk about acceptance criteria. So if you guys write a lot of your uh, BD tests to actually coincide with your user stories or user tasks? What do you mean? Okay, so like you follow Agile, well, your product, Agile, and but, sure. Scrum but. Scrum um, but. Yeah. So like, I mean, you have your acceptance criteria on each of your cards. I mean, you kind of make it a rule that you have at least, you know, if it requires a functional test compared to maybe a unit test, do you try to build in that requirement for your team or no? Uh, no, we don't. We don't build in any requirements for a number of tests or type of tests. Uh, generally, what we do is we'll have a story that tells us uh, we want, or we have a story that has certain acceptance criteria, which are usually from the perspective of using the web application. And then internally, we write a failing feature test. We write a feature test for that functionality. Then we write unit tests for any functionality we're adding. So it's we write them internally, but there's no there's no guarantee that you have to write both feature and unit tests. Like sometimes things come in that they're not they're not really conducive to writing a feature test. So we can't write it. So we just write a unit test or vice versa. Like especially in the case of bugs or features that come in that are entirely front end. Yeah. Um, it's kind of difficult to unit test those in PHP unit. Uh, so, and we haven't really got into JavaScript testing yet. So if it's presentational and it's very important, we'll write a VHAT test for it. Does the, uh, like use the, you don't use Phantom or you said you use Selenium. Would, would Selenium be able to test a lot of the front end stuff for you? Or? It does, yeah. And uh, so the idea there is uh, Selenium does actually drive the, the web browsers, and so, but we don't have it set up to drive it in every single browser and do everything, do every single uh, test in Selenium. So we've got probably uh, 40, 40 to 60 mix, 40% uh, of tests run in Selenium using JavaScript, uh, and then the other 60 are not, so they all run in Goot. Uh, but, so we don't really rely on them to test everything in JavaScript. The plan is to eventually refactor a bunch of our JavaScript so that we can test it independently of running in a browser. So do you prefer uh, Selenium versus maybe a Phantom or Zombie or whatever? I would absolutely love if Phantom or Zombie worked reliably with uh, Behat, but Zombie itself, uh, there's, there's a comment which is kind of cryptic on the project which says, use version 0.4.2, I think, because there are problems with any other version and don't know what the problems are, so we can't really fix it, and Zombie itself is up to like one point something or other, so it's, there's a big gap between the functionality, and it, basically we tried to run it, and we ended up with steps that would just fail intermittently for no reason, like we couldn't figure out a reason for it. And then the Phantom project was still so in its infancy when we started that we just picked up Selenium and went from there. Yeah, I've actually used the, uh, the web context, or common context, stuff for testing APIs, and uh, they use, uh, obviously it's symphony related, so they use Buzz right. for all their testing, and it, I found it really helpful for testing APIs and stuff, pretty, pretty simple. Now, you need to update some of the settings for your, the Buzz browser, that's a, kind of a bigger pain, but. Yeah, yeah, I, we, when I first started, I didn't know about the common context thing, or I didn't look into it, so I wrote a bunch of my own custom steps for dealing with <coughs> testing our, our routing, uh, which historically was done through HC access files. So we had a whole bunch of rules in there that we didn't want to get rid of until we had uh, written some tests for it. So, uh, so I wrote a whole bunch of stuff myself and then realized later that, oh, there's this common context thing, which does 90% of what I wanted to do. I'm an idiot. I spent a lot of time doing it. So that's why I advise always going and checking there first before you write your own stuff. Exactly. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, how you build, how often you build? Uh, do you have these VHAT tests all kind of regression suites to run? Sure. Uh, so we we have our own custom workflow that we've kind of 
molded to our, pro our project and our team. Uh, but we deal with uh, isolated feature branches. And so every feature branch that we work in gets pushed up and a build is created independently for that feature branch. And that's where we run the tests that are related to that, anything that was changed. Uh, we were working on the, the concept of checking only what was changed and only testing components that are affected by that. It's kind of difficult, but what we do now is we don't run the entire BHAT suite against every feature branch. We run it against the integration of that feature branch. So it's kind of difficult to talk about uh, frequency because it's based on how long it takes to develop that feature and then when somebody accepts it. But generally speaking, every feature gets feature tests run when it's integrated into our develop branch, when it's merged into our master branch, which is what pushes it out the door. Uh, so that goes up to our beta site, and then that gets deployed uh, later on. So it, every feature has the whole the hat suite run against it um, four times minimum, and then we've got a uh, we've got a QA team that does manual testing, and so they've got a bunch of Selenium tests that catch things on that end, and then our unit tests get run on every single build. So some features get get the test run twenty thousand times, depending on how long they take. Uh, some of them don't. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Thank you.